Welcome online family. So good to hear from you this week and we welcome you to Grace Fellowship. You are a vital part of our ministry. I uh, was very surprised again this week as I was at a public setting, um, actually at a funeral. And I had several young ladies walk up to me and say, Pastor Dave, we watch service every week. And I just, I was humbled but also grateful that God is using this medium to reach out and touch those who are not able to go to church or for whatever reason they are unable to join or they have conflicts or they choose to be at home or with a small group, sometimes a Bible study. But we just are thankful that this group of people called Grace Fellowship makes this possible and you are connected with us. So thank you so much for being a part of God's plan for us today. All right, we have already kind of announced here, so you that are online, just to give you a heads up, um, we're starting in Genesis chapter 6, and then we're turning over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from Living Bible, Genesis chapter 6. In those days, we're breaking in at verse 4. In those days and even afterwards when the evil began, beings from the spirit world were sexually involved with human women, their children became giants. I'm not going to stop too long there and linger, but this is reproduction by demonic beings that become human. Otherwise, there could be no reproduction. And the reproduction produced giants in the land one of which was Goliath, a later descendant of this very beginning. And so, of whom many legends are told when the Lord God saw the extent of human wickedness, I hear this, and that the trend and direction of men's lives were only towards evil, he was sorry he had made them. That is one of the most profound, thought-provoking um, provocative statements in the Bible. It's repeated in several different places, but can you just stop and think and try to wrap your mind around that simple statement, God was sorry. I think the King James says God, it repented God that he had made man. Now just a, a personal comment. It doesn't mean that God regrets making you. God, no, listen, God has all knowledge. God is omniscient. God knew before the foundations of the world were laid that there would have to be a sacrifice for sin. I think this is just one of those simple little indicators that God realizes that the plan that he had laid has to be brought into fruition because man has become so wicked and so sinful that it's going to require the death of his son. We that are parents, can you not feel that today? If you knew you had to sacrifice one of your children for people that didn't even love you or that would hate you or would spit on your son or nail him to a cross, God knew all of that. So it repented God. It was, he was sorry that he had made man. It broke his heart. I just want to stop there a moment just to suggest something to us. Sometimes we get the idea, I don't know where we ever got this concept or idea that God does not have emotions. Dear friends, God has emotions. God is love. God is patient. God is forgiving. God is understanding. I, this, this may set you back a little bit, but God got angry. He still does. When God sees what's going on right now to the world that he created and all that he made and what man is doing to trash it and human beings are doing to destroy themselves, it makes God angry. It's not anger as in retribution or I'm going to get even with you, but the emotion of anger is one of deep hurt. And God feels that. It broke his heart and he said, I will blot out from the face of the earth all mankind that I created. 
Yes, the animals and the reptiles and birds, for I, here it is again, I am sorry I made them. <clears throat> I love the next verse. But Noah. <laughs> King James says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I love, I love living Bible. That's just why I brought this. But Noah was a pleasure to the Lord. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Now turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now let me just give you, <clears throat> let me give you a timeline before Sheila and I do this little tag team and uh, I'll just set this up for you. In, in 2 Timothy 3, there are about 18 different expressions or descriptions of what life will be like in the last day. Okay, about 18. So we're going to take, try to take maybe two at a time. I'm going to have her read from NIV, which will give you the English, and I'm going to give you what uh, the closest translation from the Greek uh, to bring it into focus. So are you with me? Okay. Now, let's do a timeline before we get to this. The timeline is simply this. God was, was, is, and always will be the beginning. Okay? Nothing existed before God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. We don't have to argue that. We don't have to debate that. I want to be careful and sensitive, but, and, and, and this, has, this has some political overtones, but it is not meant as a political statement. It's really just a mere uh, observation. I, I heard and saw a representative of the United States government stand this week on the, at the DMZ, the de demilitarized zone, between North Korea and South Korea, looking through binoculars. And if I heard correctly, I heard her making a statement with a childlike six-year-old child glee. Oh, we saw through telescopes and they showed us solar things back three billion years ago. It was so exciting. Oh, I can't tell you how exciting it was. It was just so thrilling. Did I overdo it? Okay. And I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm a little simple-minded and my reasoning is, is very basic, childlike. So when I heard that, I just wanted to ask a question. Who was there to affirm it? How do you know it was three billion? How do you know it wasn't 30 billion? Or 300 billion? You don't know. But see, I know someone who does know. His name is God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before anything existed, God. Christians understand, church, understand, we don't have to apologize for the position we take about creation. Nothing existed before God. If you want to teach your kids science and you want to teach them history and you want to teach them geology and geography and, and everything else, all you got to do is take them to Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God. That's where it starts. That's where it will end. In the end, it will still be God. He is without time or space or age. He exists eternally. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. It's just, it's just real simple. You can research it and debate and spend billions of dollars at Princeton or wherever you want, but they're not going to come up with any simple answer like that. You're only going to find it in the Word of God. Okay? Now, my timeline, okay? God. Then we come to the flood. Uh, and, and an ark and an individual named are you sure where'd you get that myth oh okay well if it's in the bible then we'll we'll accept it okay 
at least most of us here. The world may not, but we'll accept it. There was, there was this flood. God gave 120 years of preparation. Now, I'm toying with your minds a little bit because I want you to hang with me. I want you to see the transition and, and the connection between that and what Timothy is telling us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that Paul is writing from a hole in the ground. Let me, let me, just, let, let me just qualify that for a moment. When we say Paul was writing from a jail cell, we think of one of these beautiful prisons that are run by the state that are air conditioned and heat and they have cafeterias and they, and they go and they have Peloton workout rooms and, and all the rest. No, no, no. Paul was in a hole. A hole about six, eight, ten feet down with nothing in it. No windows, no air conditioning, no water. He was at almost at the end of his life when he writes this book, 2 Timothy. This is a letter Paul's writing to one of his sons in the faith. But back to their timeline, here's Noah. And God gives warning for 120 years. Now, I'm just going to give you a parenthetical statement. Many, many pastors are standing in pulpits today across America. There are approximately 380,000 churches in America. They're shrinking rapidly. I heard the other day, I, don't, I can't verify the statement, that 1,500 ministers a day are now dropping out of ministry. I do know the last statement I read was 5,000 churches a year are closing. That's going to accelerate. But here's the timeline, 120 years. Now, what, what challenges me as a pastor, and I, and I, I think Noah, Noah just had to, he had to know this was God's call. How in the world would you, would you go for, he preached for 120 years. How many converts did he have? Zero. Apart from eight members of his own family. That's all that he took on the ark with him. So I'm simply saying to you, I heard a, had a conversation with someone this morning who was talking about a pastor friend and the pastor friend said, can you come and help me do so and so? I'm burned out. That's very common now. Just as some of you are in your job. Listen, Satan wants to take you down. He wants to take ministers down. He wants to close churches. If they're preaching the word of God. If they're not, then they're, they're appealing to the thousands. That's another story we'll deal with later. But the timeline again. Here's no beginning, creation, Noah, God wipes out the earth, sends water. You think they've had floods in Florida and South Carolina? No, I'm, I just want you to do comparisons. Do you know when the, when the ark... After 150 days settled on Mount Ararat, you know how high that was? 17,000 feet above sea level. That's a flood. Just, I'm just drawing a picture for you, okay? So we go from creation to the flood to Noah to rebuilding, literally rebuilding civilization. And we go through the Old Testament prophets, the major prophets and minor prophets, and we come to the last book, Malachi, in the Old Testament, and then we realize there's a 400-year timeline of silence. God wasn't silent, but there was no one, I shouldn't say that, there were people listening, but there's no record of anything transpiring in that 400-year gap until Matthew. And Jesus is born. And 33 years he lives on earth. And then he ascends to the Father. Are you with me, church? Okay. So we have, we have the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
40 days, he ascends to the Father. 10 days later, the Holy Spirit descends on all those who are seeking and waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that is called what in Acts 2? Pentecost. Thank you. Now, I lay all that out because we are now living and have been for 2,000 years living in some call it the age of grace. Some call it the church age. Some call it the Pentecostal age. The age subsequent to Pentecost, okay? Now, we're, we're, we also know, let me, let me, whew, okay, let's, let's push through this. We, we also know that at some point, according to God's word, time is going to end. Time as we know it. God is going to come back. He's going to, look, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep pushing, okay? I'm saying that because there's so much going on in my spirit and my mind that I know I'm just, I don't want to wear you out, but I, I, I just want to give you what God wants you to hear today. Listen, we, we know the next event, okay? Let's do it this way. The next major event on the calendar of God, not man, but God, not Rome and the Pope, not some denominational leader, not the church, the earthly church, but according to God's word, we know that the next major event is the returning of Christ coming back to take his bride home, and that's called the rapture. The rapture. Thank you. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. Dead shall be raised incorruptible. We that are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's rapturo. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Okay? You, you got the picture on the timeline? See, I just want to underscore something again. Once we are raptured out of here, we're going to be with the Lord forever. There's no test period, no, no time where we're going to come back and hang around and have to fight with the devil. You got it? Are you with me? So the next event for the church, the body of Christ, is the rapture. And we're going to be with him forever. Seven years will transpire Three and a half of Antichrist, three and a half years of persecution. Comes back and sets up his millennial kingdom, that's a thousand years. And then we shall meet him together with him in the air. Marriage supper of the Lamb. He's setting up a new kingdom here on earth. Now that's my final point in the timeline. He's going to cleanse this earth. Again, I want to be biblically sound and clear. It won't be by water. Okay? That's why there's a, a rainbow in the sky. That rainbow in the sky was God's promise that I'll never destroy the earth again by water. It will be by fire. Okay? Now, uh, I have Sheila, my friend, sitting over here to my right for you online. And uh, I'll try to just push through this, Sheila, if you'll hang with me, okay? Let me read, let me read for you. I told you there are about 18 descriptions of what transpires in the last day. Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days, now, that's where we're living. In the last days, it is going to be very difficult to be a Christian. For people will love only themselves and their money. Hmm. What, what does your translation say there? Give me like two or three words there. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Lovers of self, lovers of money. Okay, the Greek says two things. Misdirected love. Misplaced love. 
See, love as we know it, everybody's in love today. They love something. I, I've got to be careful. I'm going to be very sensitive. But I meet people almost every day that love their pets more than they love their spouse. I, I'm just telling you. Just, that's misdirected love. Okay. Lovers of self, lovers of money. What's the one common denominator driving this world today? Money. money. China, Russia, India, America, money. And the more you give me, the better it is. As long as I don't have to earn it, just keep giving it. We'll deal with that in a moment. Okay. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Uh, Living Bible says they will be proud and boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to parents. What does it say there? Boastful and proud. Boastful and proud. Abusive, disobedient to their parents. Wow. Did you hear that? Abusive and disobedient to parents. Wow. Uh, the Greek there literally says the removal of moral absolutes. In other words, I'm my own God. Removal of all moral absolutes. What we grew up learning and being taught in our homes and in our schools doesn't exist anymore. I don't even want to get into it because it would take way too much of your time. But... I, I hope that you are aware or checking or guarding what your grandchildren are being taught in the public school system. I, I hope you are aware. Because we all know what's going on, do we not? Let me just give you one illustration. Canada just passed a law that when a child is born now in Canada, they cannot put their sexual gender on their birth certificate. They, they can wait until however, three, four, five, that they decide what they're going to be. Oh, we, 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 take it, we, we take it almost as a joke. No, 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 it's, it's reality. Five-year-olds in our schools are now being offered the opportunity to change gender. Okay. Proud and boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to parents, ungrateful to them, and thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others, constant liars and troublemakers. What's, uh, what's NIV say, Sheila? Ungrateful, unholy. Ungrateful, unholy. Go on, one more. Um, without love, unforgiving, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, okay. conceited. Okay. Here's what the Greek says on all those. Intellectually snobs. Pride. Intellectual snobs. Okay. Pride. Disintegration of language. That's crude. Crude. This is the Greek translation. This is the original. Crude. Intellectual snobs. Loss of parental control. Am I, am I describing 2022? Where you live? I'm not describing it. Paul is. Okay. Snobs. Pride. What school did you graduate from? What doctor's degree do you have? I paid 300000 for my degree from Harvard. And guess what? The government's going to give me money back. I may get a whole $10,000 so I can make a deposit on a house. You couldn't make a deposit on a shed for that.
Do you hear me? Brainwashed. Intellectually naive. That's, that's frank, frankly, that's what the... Now, here's, here, here's the next word. It picks up on, on all of these. This is, this, is, this is the one that jumped out at me about the description of where we are today in 2022. This is the Greek word here for what she just read to us, in intellectual snobs and entitlement and all that. Entitled and ungrateful. You owe me. You owe me for several reasons, and I'm going to be sensitive and careful, but because of my sexual orientation, or my racial or ethnic orientation, or where I was born, or that I had no parents, or that I was raised in, a, in, the, in the inner city, or my grandma had, was, was in poverty, and we had to clean houses and, and restrooms to make a living, and, and, uh, and, and the neighbor has a brand new car, and so I am entitled to a brand new car. In t the, the, I think of all these words almost, the one that just seems again to rise almost above all others is the word entitlement. We are raising a generation that lives with entitlement. You owe me. I owe you nothing. Next word. Disrespect for the holy. Profane. Next word, disintegration of the family. Next word, devils. Now, let me go back and pick up so you'll, you'll parallel these. They will be hard-headed, never give in to others. They will be constant liars, troublemakers. Think nothing of immorality. There is no moral code in our country today. Apart from the word of God, there's no moral code. I, what I want is what I'm going to get. You owe me. Now, I'm, I'm, I want to be careful. I don't want to over, overreact on this. But what, what we have seen evidence of this this week in several cities. If you don't give me what I want, I'll kill you. Mob violence, snatch and grab. I was touched because uh, I have a warm spot in my heart for Wawa's because I know several of their managers and regional managers and a vice president and living in New Jersey as we did, we used to minister every week. The church where we were served, where Sandra and I served, we would meet every week and have they would use our facility. 15, 20, 25 Wawa managers. There are 15 Wawa's in Vineland, New Jersey alone. I'm saying all that because when I saw the news the other night, what happened in Philadelphia? A hundred wild animals storming a Wawa and turning it into shambles. Mob violence. Again, the, the in inference area is, you owe me. I don't care if you, we're not paying for this. We got a right to come into your store and take anything we want. We are seeing small businesses closed by the thousands in our nation right now. Because small business owners can no longer make a profit. I talk to the local Wawa manager yesterday morning at 7 o'clock. She said, Pastor Dave, if that kind of thing happens, we just walk out. This bunch of stuff in here is not worth my life. All I'm saying to you, church, is this is the age and time in which we're living. Are you okay with me? Incontinent, out of control, no discipline. Here's the next word, savage, barbaric, violent.
They will be back in the, again, back in living Bible. They will be rough and cruel, sneer at those who try to be good. They will betray their friends, hot-headed, puffed up with pride, prefer good times to worshiping God. They will go to church. This is one that grabbed me. They will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Sheila, what does that say? It's down at the last part, like verse... Four, five of chapter three. What's NIV say about that? The very end. They were rough and cruel and sneer. Having forms of having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Okay. Yeah, we're we're gonna have prayer. I saw them coming in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Loss of love for what is decent and moral. Let me just run these through. Broken relationships, no consequences to decisions made. Hedonism. I'm I'm giving you what's in the Bible, okay? Hedonism, living for pleasure having a form of piety, but denying the power. Who is the power? God. Who is the power? God. Yeah, you're right, but it's more defined than that. Who? Who is the power? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, when I go away, and Jesus said, when I go away, I'm going to send another, and he shall not only be with you, but he shall be in you. That's the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. God came with you this morning. I've said this many times as we worship. Whatever you're going through, God knows about it. And you're not alone if you're a child of God. God is with you. If you love God, the Holy Spirit indwells you. All you need to do is declare from your mouth and your heart, devil, you're a liar, a loser. I'm an overcomer. God's power lives in me. In the name of Jesus, I am forgiven. The blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin. And you're bound to hell, and I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Sheila. The last one, he closes us with this. Having a form of piety, but denying the power from such, turn away. Why? Because we are at the end of the age. That's what Paul says. Now, Paul said that 2,000 years ago. But remember something with God. One day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It really was two days ago. I I sense your, you know, I knew what was going on in the back, and I I sense we're going to pray for Tom, and we're going to have communion as we close. But I sense your minds just kind of whirling this morning. And I I just want to tell you again, this is a hard kind of message to to proclaim because it's, it's, it's exegetical. It's down at the grassroots. But God wouldn't let me up on this to just let you know that wherever you are in your walk with Christ, or maybe you've never turned your life over to Christ, and you need to do that this morning before you take communion. What more, here, here's a rhetorical question, we close. What more does God have to do to get our attention? Nothing. Not according to this. My heart was broken as I heard. I, in fact, I watched it twice on YouTube just to make sure I had it right. I watched a, nation, a nationally known theologian and evangelist say this week that in the latest survey taken among Christians, 75% said there's more than one way to God. That's where we are. This book that I read says Jesus Christ said, I am. I, singular, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Why? Because he paid the price. Let's pray. Lord, ah, wow. What more can I say? You've said it all through your word. I've stumbled around, but Lord, thank you that I think we've gotten a bigger picture this morning of the day and time in which we live. And we just need to release everything right now. Tom Morgan is on his way to the emergency room, one of our brothers dealing with a physical crisis. Tom's not been well and dealing with heart problems. Lord, you have all power. You can spare him and raise him up. And Lord, if, if you take him home, Tom's ready. We just offer prayer for him as we prayed for Howard Brinsfield earlier. Death is not our enemy. Death is the beginning of life for the believer in Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate in communion, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we thank you as we celebrate this sacrament today, Worldwide Communion Sunday. We join with millions and millions and millions and billions around the world today saying thank you, Jesus, for giving your life so that we may have life. Hallelujah. Amen. Take your little cup, please. If you're adept and have the capacity to just pull that little plastic lid back and reach for the wafer. They make you work to get in them, don't they? By the way, you, you don't only have to take communion on Sundays at church. I know people that take communion on a regular basis. Why? Because you're a priest unto God. So if you'll take that little wafer and take it, this is a body, represents the body of the Lord Jesus broken for you. Take and eat and be thankful. Likewise, the cup filled with that little bit of juice just represents the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood that was sacrificed on Calvary for you. He said, drink ye all of it. In remembrance that Christ died for you. Holy Spirit, again, we just ask for a quietness and a peace and a rest and the joy of the Lord to flow in us and through us right now. We owe everything to you, Jesus. Without you, we are nothing. We can do nothing apart from you. It's all because of God's amazing grace. It's all because of Calvary. He took my place. And someday, some glorious morning, I will see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us pray. 
Jesus now we are standing in his presence on holy ground and now may the love of God the Father fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest with us all may we go in the peace of God's eternal presence. Oh God, this week, unleash a mighty outpouring of your spirit through Grace Fellowship. We're here not just to feel good, to worship, to hug on each other, but we're here to be lights in a dark, dark world neighborhood, workplace, and for some, families. I feel, a, I feel a strong drawing in my heart right now to pray for some families that are going through trial. Break Satan's bondage. Set the captive free. Let us walk out of here in perfect peace and rest. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus and all the church said, Amen. 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 You can put your little cup in one of the baskets in the back, and I think there's a little trash can out in the foyer and in the back.